Hi, this is Pastor Dave Gable. Welcome back to another message here on our Gwanda Assembly of God YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about treasures in our series, Wages, Gifts, and Treasures. Uh, grab a coffee, notebook, sit back, and take some notes. Uh, let's read Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Um, as you all know, we've been doing a series here called Wages, Gifts, and Treasures. Today is the wrap-up week for this, and we're obviously going to be talking about treasures. Now, as I was, I've mentioned in the past four or five weeks, this can be one of those confusing things, and that's why we're talking about it. Because there are wages, and there are gifts, and there are treasures. And gifts are not wages, and wages are not treasures. But the, all three really do exist. And the Bible talks about them specifically, so I think we ought to know what those are. Some of the problems of wondering if you're good enough for God to love you and, you know, spending all your money on God things so that you'll have treasure in heaven, these are all confusing things that people battle with all the time. And they really skew our view of who God is and what he thinks of us and what he wants from us and how much we have the ability to make him happy with us or not so that's why we've done the important thing of looking at these and what does it say. So just a real quick review. Wages. Wages are things that we can earn. They are resulting circumstances for, from things we do on this earth. If I work hard, I'm likely to get promoted. That's not a gift, it's a wage. I worked hard. When I get paid at the end of the week, it's a wage. When I treat people junky, and so I have less friends than other people, that's a wage. That isn't the hand of God moving in your life. That is just you creating or failing to create good or not so good circumstances in your own life. Now, there are certainly circumstances that are out of our control, but most of what wages are is that. Circumstances and things we create in this world. The Bible says you will reap what you sow. That's wages, okay? When we talk about gifts, gifts by definition are something you get that you didn't earn. And a true gift has no strings. A true gift is a gift even if you don't send a thank you card, though you should, right? If there's a string attached, it's not a gift. It's a wage in disguise, right? Now the gifts we receive from God are his love. I think each of us receives gifts in our physical life some people are great at math. Some people are great at knowing how people feel. Some people are really um, mathematical in the way they think, and some, some people are just really aware of what other people need. Those are gifts. There are also, also spiritual gifts. There are gifts like a word of knowledge, gifts like prophecy. Some of the gifts of the Spirit are speaking in tongues, being able to pray over people at times and see them be healed. Those are gifts. And here's the crazy things, thing. The gifts are gifts, which means I can't earn them by praying more than other people. And I also can't lose them by being unaware of how to use them or unaware that God exists at all. I believe with all of my heart that there are people in this world who are actually duped and use their gift unknowingly and totally the wrong way. Do I believe that there are people you could sit in front of who could tell you where your lost wallet is? Yeah, I do. I think that legitimately happens. But I think what's happening is that person likely is gifted by God with a gift of discernment or a word of knowledge, and they're simply being manipulated by the spirit realm around them to cause them to believe something other than the truth about their creator and what the gift was intended to be used for. But it's a gift. So by earning or not earning wages, they can't move away from it. It's there. They can misuse it, but it's a gift. In the same way that I could buy my son a brand new microphone for recording video for his birthday, and he could take it out in the driveway and run it over with the car. It's his, not mine. I gave it as a gift, right? It's the same way with our gifts. So there are gifts God has given you, 
And he doesn't take them away if you don't use them well, although he wants you to use them well, right? So there's a little bit on gifts. Now, treasures are a really interesting thing because the Bible says store up treasures in heaven, doesn't it? It says, do not lay up in Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, first off, this is not talking about wages. Very important distinction. Now, one thing we can do as human beings is we can make wages our treasure. And everybody knows, I, I jokingly say sometimes, all I'm asking for is one chance to prove that money can't make you happy. <laughs> I'm just looking for one chance to prove that. But it really doesn't. It really doesn't. I want to look at uh, a portion of 1 Corinthians, and then we're going to rip a little bit of this apart because it's just, this is something I found this week, never saw it before, has everything to do with what surrounds this whole thing. Okay, let's read this part first. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is, Christ, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's works will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now it would be really easy to confuse what this is actually saying. What I'd like to do, this is a familiar passage. What I'd like to do is give you a little bit of context, okay? Context basically means the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea, and in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. Let me just throw a story out there, okay? Let's say you know a couple of people who have plenty, and you happen to walk up behind them, and they're talking about, and you don't see their faces, you just hear what they're saying. They're talking about a family you know. And they're saying, yeah, the kids are like dressed kind of ratty and, you know, their car's loud and, you know, they're just sharing these details. And that's all you hear and you walk away. The initial thought I would think of most people would be that the, these couple of people think more of themselves than they do this other person and they're talking about the differences and they're kind of talking down because of what this other family doesn't have or hasn't fixed. But the context is everything. If you saw their faces, it would add context. It would give you more information about the surrounding story that would help you to interpret what it is they're saying. The story is that they've noticed some need in a family that they love very much. And they're alone talking about it because they don't want this family to be hurt or embarrassed about what their need is. And they're talking about how they could get a small group of people together who would remain nameless, who could bless the need of this family. That's the whole context. And we do this as human beings to each other all the time. I have more, way more than one time assumed intent and attitude on somebody because of something I heard said or something they said and found out later I was totally wrong. Totally didn't understand it at all. Well, it's important to understand that in any passage of Scripture, there may very well be verses that surround it that add a whole lot more meaning to the Scripture. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the verse Jeremiah 29, 11. It's quoted all the time. For I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. The context is kind of like this. 
if I had Brady, my son Brady up here, and I was holding his left hand, and in my right hand was a paddle, and I was about to tan his butt, and was saying, I have plans for you to prosper. I don't want to hurt you. I want to give you hope in a future. That's the context of that verse. There are strings on that verse. And human beings like to quote, he has plans to prosper me, not to harm me. He's not, I'm about to harm him. I don't have, my plans are not to, to, are to prosper you, not to harm you, as I'm about to harm you. Right? You ha it's really important to know the context or you get these thought processes that he's a loving God. He would never hurt anybody. He would never do anything to cause me discomfort. He wants me just to be happy. His, I'm here to be happy. That's really not why we're here. We're here to glorify his name. Are we here to know him and enjoy him and spend forever with him? Yes. This world is not the goal. It's not. Happy here doesn't really weigh that much. God actually said of Paul, it, I believe he said to someone concerning Paul, I will show him all the things he must suffer for my name. That's what he said. And did Paul suffer things? Yep, shipwrecked multiple times. One city, they got mad and stoned him, drug him outside the city, thought he was dead. He wasn't. What do you think Paul did? Went back into the city. That's either led by the Spirit or just dumb, okay? But we're just not here. We're here, I think we're here to be content, to learn to be content in whatever state I find myself. I've learned to be abased, to abound, to have much or little. That's what we're designed to do, to learn to grow some callus and be productive people in this world, all right? He did not design us to be crybabies in the Lord, Okay? Let me show you what surrounds this scripture. I'm going to flip to it in my Bible. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So we're talking about storing up treasures in heaven. And my question, because I'm an analytical person, I want to know the how and why and what fits where. What does this even mean? It says, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, store up treasures in heaven. How do we do that? What are treasures? Does that mean if I write a check to the church to buy 100 Bibles to pass out to people, then I just, that 100 bucks is in an account on the other side of the gates where Peter's going to have the clipboard. Is that what it means? What does it mean that? I think there's something in the context in the surrounding story that actually lends some light to this and, and I had never seen it before. We are 3, 3, 10 to 15. Okay, listen to this. He who plants and he who waters are one and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Then Paul goes on to say, According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's works will be manifest for the, that day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Skipping ahead, if, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. You see that little distinction right there if all we build with are things that are going to be burned up, we will suffer the loss of that. Not the loss of grace, not the loss of his love or his plan, but these little rewards, these treasures, we will suffer the loss. We will have done something and it didn't amount to anything. But what he's talking about here, before he says, talks about building on this foundation and storing up treasures, he actually says, you are God's field. You are God's building. 
Here's what I'm learning from that. The work that we can do, the efforts that we can put forward that actually result in treasures have everything to do with the foundation of Jesus Christ in a life being laid down and built upon. Right? So, if God prompts me to walk over to Annette's house who lives across the street from me and hand her 50 bucks for groceries, and that blesses and builds on her faith because she had asked God to help her, that is a treasure. How quality? Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones? I don't know. I don't know if that has to do with the level of faith it took for me to do that or what it was, but I would have to say that it has everything to do with the impact it had in the life. If all I did was walked across the street and said, he just wants you to know that he loves you today. I don't know what's going on. But she had prayed that morning, Lord, I just need to know that you are with me and that you do have a plan for me. That word could be worth more than any amount of money, any amount of time I could possibly give because he plugged in an absolute hunk of gold or jewel into the wall of her faith that day. Now, it may be that God's laying a foundation in somebody's life of Jesus Christ, just beginning to lay the foundation. And it may be that he says, hey, take that little booklet that has the plan of salvation with you today. And you're at Walmart or you're at Tim Hortons and you just feel impressed to hand that to somebody. And God goes, one more brick in that foundation. Is it complete? Nope. The foundation isn't complete. But one more solid, quality brick has been laid in place of that foundation. I really believe that the treasures we can lay up have everything to do with building the foundation of Jesus Christ in the lives of people and then building upon it based on what this says. The crazy thing is we could be building up treasures and not even know it because it doesn't necessarily have to be something that we think is overtly Christian at all. It could be as simple as buying someone a coffee who wasn't expecting it, you know? They'll, you know, sometimes you go through the drive through at Tim Hortons and somebody will be like, I want to pay for the car behind me. You don't know where that person is. You don't know what that person's request to God is. There are people out there that are just wanting to know that he is real and that he loves them. And he may be plugging you into a spot where you do something you have no idea and you're storing up treasures. Now, the other thing is there's nothing that I know of in the Bible that gives us any indication at all that putting forth the effort to store up treasures is wrong or evil in any way. I think our heart, though, and our attitude in doing that has to be pushed by him in some way, or most of it will probably be wood, hay, and stubble. One other thing I think that we really need to think about here is, let's say somebody's faith is growing. And the people surrounding them keep shoveling wood chips onto the foundation. The foundation's going to get taller, which is part of what it looks like when a wall is built, but that foundation, those wood chips and hay and stuff are going to have to be swept away for quality pieces to be put in place, right? I mean, I've never seen a brick building. I've certainly never seen a gold block building. But I've never seen a brick building or a block building that had wood chips and chunks of branches and sticks and hay sticking out from the mortar lines because they're liabilities. So think about this. This is huge. Are there places where your skewed view of God or baggage you've had from the past whatever that is from church experiences, is thrown into someone else's foundation, what happens then? It got put on there, but it's going to need to be cleared away. Have you ever had a stump ground in your yard and tried to shovel the wood chips? It stinks. 
especially when it's wet and it rips them up into like these long strands. You can't shovel that. And if you leave the wood chips in the ground, 99% of the time grass is not going to grow there because of the chemicals inside the wood chips. It takes a lot longer to clean them off than it does to dump them on the foundation. Right? So when God gives you an opportunity to put the truth of him on the foundation or on the building wall in another person's life, let me give you a recommendation. The word of God never returns void. It is always a solid and square and plumb and true piece of his foundation for their life. So if you're not sure what to say, give them an undigested chunk of God's word and say, this ministered to me. Ask him to speak to you through it. Right? I've talked before about sometimes we take pieces of uh, scripture, and Sarah and I have been talking about this even the last week, too often we fall into a place where we have an opinion or a thought and we look for scripture to back up what we think. Where our lives should really be going to scripture and finding fresh perspectives and things that affect the way we think about the world. If all I do is look for scriptures that back up what I think, I'll find them and I will certainly not find the ones who kind of paint a little bit different picture, right? Because of human nature. I want to be backed up and make my point. But when we take the whole of Scripture and we let it interpret itself, all of a sudden we have a biblical foundation that's been built with bricks of the Word of God in our lives. And you know what? It's okay to say, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure what the answer to that is. I'm sure there's an answer in the Word of God for it. And I'll, I'll look or I would you know, use Bible Gateway or use uh, an app to just start digging into the Word of God, but let the Bible be what it is, the ultimate authority in a life. Okay? So we are building in each other's lives. I want to um, wanna look at, actually, I want to go backwards. This is the scripture we opened up with. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field do you have a little bit different all of a sudden impression when I read that first line? Knowing that in our portion in 1 Corinthians, he said, for you are God's field. You are his building. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So the kingdom of heaven is like that treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven is literally a treasure in itself where we can store up treasures and look where it's hidden. In the field. Inside of us. Yeah. The, the writer of 1 Corinthians says, you are God's field. You are his building. So this is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let's look at it from this perspective. And this is just a, a creative way of looking at this. If your life is a field, which the Bible says it is, and the kingdom of heaven is a treasure buried in your life. Doesn't it make sense that people in your world are going to notice that there's a treasure hidden in that field and they are going to turn away from all that has been a treasure before and they're going to seek out that treasure. Now an unsaved, unknowing world will try to take wages to do that. We see that in the picture of Simon the sorcerer who's with Peter and he sees all these mighty works and he sees Peter lay his hands on somebody and pray and the Holy Spirit fills them and Simon says, can I buy that? And Peter rebukes him and Simon's attitude seems good because he says, again, pray that none of these things happen in my life. 
But when the world sees this treasure for what it really is buried in the field of your life, they are going to try and get it. They are going to try and get it. But are they seeing... I mean, if I found a slightly uncovered hole filled with wood chips in a field, I would not be running out to sell all my stuff to buy that. If I saw a little sparkle sticking out of the dirt in a field and went over there and was like, Ooh, I would probably not even tell my wife. Why risk anyone finding out? I'm just saying. Why risk it? I would go to the owner and be like, not too excited. I don't want to be too excited. I'll tip them off. But I would look to buy that field, right? Because of what it could do in my life. The crazy thing is, in this field, I could take every bit of that gold and begin to plug it in my life, and it never leaves the field. Because we're not talking about a wage now. We're talking about a gift that when we build it, it becomes a treasure. And here's the crazy thing. You know how it says, uh, don't store up treasures here where moth and rust decay and thieves break in and steal. Store it up there where no one can break in and take it and moth and rust can't access it. When you build a true foundation in someone's life, especially out of gold, out of truth, out of the word of God, that's a really hard thing to steal. And nothing in this world can break apart a true foundation laid in the life or in the field of a person. We are going to spend eternity together. Those of us who believe and trust in the blood of Christ to cover our lives and have turned over the keys are going to spend eternity together. I don't know about you, but I do not plan on rusting. And no moths are going to eat me in heaven. But you're going to get to have fun with me and throw football with me and we're going to go fishing, spend time with Jesus. I mean, it, you can't possibly imagine what it's going to be like. The treasures don't rust or wear away and moths don't eat them because it's us. It's us. We are literally each other's treasure laid up in heaven. So it ain't going to be like, hey, Dave Gable, up here's your mansion and treasure over here. Look at that, it's bigger than, uh, I don't know, whoever's. My wife's, yeah. Her treasure's going to be bigger than mine. She has to live with me. That's a huge treasure. So, it just, I, I think of that like, oh, I wonder if my treasure will be really dinky. Am I going to get there and be like, it's all burned up and there'll be like an ash with like a little like earring diamond sitting on the ground, you know. I worry about that sometimes, you know. I don't, I don't want to be showed up by anybody in heaven, you know. How stupid is that to even think anything like that? But I wonder, like, what's it going to turn into? And the, we don't know. You don't know how it impacted a life, right? But it's just not going to be that situation. He's going to be, hey, check out, here's your treasure. And it's going to be a football stadium full of people going, yeah, you did that thing in my life. And hey, check out, I got part of you over here in mine. That's going to be awesome, ain't it? Okay. So there are wages, that's here. There are gifts from him, no strings. But we can earn treasures as we pour into each other's lives. That's why we're here, right? What is church? What is my job? What is this building and this organization for? It's for the building up of all of us for works of service. To who? Your mailbox? Your driveway? No, to people, right? That's why we're here. God ordained this building and this position for me and your attendance here to teach us and build us up for making treasures. That's awesome. That's awesome. Really awesome. What are some examples of treasures? I think we've already talked about that. There's good treasure, gold, silver, precious stones. There's bad treasure. Wood hand stubble. Not that it's bad, it's just not as useful. But the point is this. They're real. Treasures are real. Amen? I've said uh, a lot of times, the only thing you can take with you out of this life is people. 
right? That's all you can take. And isn't it funny that that seems to be what we just found in 1 Corinthians, that we actually are the treasure that we can build in each other. Awesome. How about we do this? Let's pray together that God would give us a clear understanding in everyday life of which of these we're looking at. Okay? Let's pray that on a day where we're bad wage earners, that the gifts don't go away. They don't change. And that treasures can be earned on the worst day and the best day. And they have nothing to do with the wages we've earned here. I hope today's message has uh, shed some new light for you on just what treasures are in our lives. And I hope that as each day of each week goes on in your life, that you will look for new and creative ways to use the gifts God has given you to build treasures in the lives around you. Have a super week. We'll see you again here soon.